I think democracy is difficult to measure. Um, there are a number of facets, and you can argue it in a number of ways. The best measure that I've ever found uh, is the Democracy Index, which is the Economist Intelligence Units Index, and that measures effectively five things. Electoral process and pluralism, civil liberties, the functioning of government, political participation, and political culture. Now, out of 167 countries, we don't come first. Uh, we're not in the top 10, we're number 18. The top country is, is Norway, and most European countries um, are in the top 10 or 20. Uh, we're number 18, and we have what the Democracy Index describes as full democracies. Now, the next category below that is full democracies, and then there's something called hybrid democracies, and that's where Georgia falls. So we're not at 167 countries at the moment, Georgia is around 102. Um, now, all measures are subjective, but I think you can argue that a number of ways. But I think it shows you the difference in perceptions and how these things are measured. So although on paper we don't look particularly democratic, in practice there are a number of things about the United Kingdom that makes it a fully functioning democracy. Now, we're not a republic, we're what's called a constitutional monarchy which means our head of state is a member of the royal family, Her Majesty of Queen, who's been on the throne for 60 years. But the powers of the monarch are constrained by a constitution, which in our case isn't written down anywhere. We're one of three or four countries in the world that don't have a written constitution. So you can't go and consult it as you can the Georgian constitution and say this is my right or this is my obligation. That document doesn't exist. What we have is what we call an uncodified constitution, which is based upon ancient laws, practice, precedent, custom. Again, it all sounds very convenient, and yes, you can change it as you go along, uh, and, and you can massage it as you go along, but there are some quite strict rules and procedures as well. One of the fundamental underpinnings of that democracy is parliament. I think this is an interesting question. I'd be very interested in your questions later on, given that your constitution is set to change next year to give your parliament greater powers. But we in the UK operate on the principle of what we call parliamentary sovereignty. And that means the following things. Our parliament, which is both upper and lower houses, and strangely the Queen is included in parliament. Yeah, that's always hard to explain why is supreme over government institutions. In other words, the government of the day is subordinate to Parliament, and those who have been elected into Parliament will sit in Parliament. Parliament can make laws on anything. British Parliament tomorrow could decide to make laws out, you know, banning ham and pickle sandwiches. It could decide to make a law saying that everybody has to go to university at the age of 35. There is no restriction on the laws that Parliament can make. There's also the principle that no parliament can bind a future parliament. In other words, what parliament decides today can be changed by parliament tomorrow. It can't tie itself over. And that's really important, because having joined the European Union, one of the things that we have done is subordinate our parliament to certain EU legislation. And again, this will be an important point for Georgia going forward. So if laws are passed in the European Union, we have to pass them in the UK. But we can change that if we want by throwing out the legislation that makes us subordinate to the European Parliament. So Parliament can make things up as it goes along and it has every right to. The further principle is that a valid act of Parliament can't be challenged by a court of law. So Parliament is the supreme lawmaker. If it comes down to a debate between the judges and Parliament, Parliament also wins. So within the framework of our parliament, there is supreme power and it is sovereign. Although it can choose to surrender those powers at any point, it can choose to bring them back again. <coughs> so the question is, how do we get there? Because we've got a lot of curious anomalies in our system. And how we've got there is through a long history that is well over 800 years. If we go back to 12, uh, 1215, um, 
That was really the first document, Magna Carta, which means big charter. And if any of you watched the news recently, you'll know that our Prime Minister was interviewed in the United States and did not know what Magna Carta meant, um, which was rather embarrassing. But what the Magna Carta did was give, in document form, certain liberties to citizens of the United Kingdom, or England as it was then, because we had not quite all the Scottish and the Welsh under control. Um, and it also put limits on the king, because the problem at the time was that we were fighting a lot of wars with France, because the king actually had the rights to certain parts of France, but he couldn't afford to go to battle every time. So every time he wanted to fight the French, he raised taxes and went to war. And all the big businessmen at the time started to get a little irritated that their businesses were funding the king's wars with the French. So the Magna Carta was a document that was effectively generated by barons, by businessmen, who wanted to put limitations on the crown and ensure that he could not raise taxes without the consent of the Royal Council. And that was a council made up of what's called barons, or effectively, um, I suppose, people like Mr. Bender-Kitzer at the time, who were, who were very powerful and influential with their money and their influence. Now, the Royal Council was sort of the first parliament, really, but it wasn't elected. It, it was by people who had money and influence. The first elected parliament in the UK was in 1265, and that was the very first time that anybody was actually elected to go forward to take part in a parliament or council that exercised some control or restriction on the king or queen of the day. It wasn't particularly representative because those people who could vote tended to be the rich and powerful. And it's not until about 1780 that more than 3% of the United Kingdom could actually vote. So it's been a very long progression. It took five or 600 years for us to start to allow a significant portion of the population to vote. And of course, it wasn't until the 1920s that we actually gave women the vote. So it's been a very long process. The Bill of Rights in 1689 gave yet more powers to Parliament over the Crown. In between, we had a civil war and a bit of a revolution and then a restoration with the head of the king. We had a republic for a while, technically, and then we rebuilt. But that placed further limits on the Crown. So what you see over a period of 800 years is the Crown, and by that I mean the King and the Queen, having less powers as Parliament and the people asserted their rights and their democratic rights um, to gain greater representation of their views and greater control over the country. 1689 was the first time there was a requirement for a regular election. It doesn't say how often regular it actually is, it just means you've got to have a regular election. Even now, according to the Act of Parliament, you have to have an election at least once every five years. There is an indication of when the date should be, but if the Prime Minister decides he wants to dissolve Parliament and call an election, he can do so. There is no set date as set by, for example, your constitution for when one of us holds elections. As I say, this dates back to the Bill of Rights, which is regular elections. It also said, very importantly, that the, 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 the king or the queen couldn't just tax people as he or she saw fit without Parliament being able to have a say in the matter. Again, it comes back to taxes. A lot of our parliamentary system is driven by war and tax. Who wants to fight and who pays for it? It also said, interest, interestingly, that you could not inflict any excessive or cruel punishment on anybody. But it didn't say what excessive or cruel punishment actually was. So that's had to be defined since then. And again, to just give you an illustration of how our country has grown, there is a clause contained within the 1689 Bill of Rights that says, if you are Catholic, you cannot sit on the throne of the United Kingdom. Which again is deeply uncomfortable if you're British and we're encouraging um, other countries not to engage in discrimination. And indeed it's illegal in the UK to, discri to discriminate on religious grounds. And yet we ban in law still the sitting on the throne of a Catholic, or indeed the marrying of a Catholic into the royal family. That's currently being changed. 
Um, but again, you can see these curious anomalies um, that, that, that creep up. So what we've got is a system that over 800 years has grown as a result of wars, tax, fights between rich businessmen and rich influencers, and the crown. And what we've seen is that the crown has eroded and declined in influence, although it still exists, and that the power of the electorate and the power of the people has grown over the years. What I think it's given us is something that on paper doesn't look great. Um, and it's not a model that I would be selling around the world if I was absolutely honest. I wouldn't be coming to Georgia and saying, what you really need is a constitutional monarchy. Uh, and you need to scrap your uh, constitution. That, that, that's, that's not the kind of thing I'd advocate. But what it has given us is a very strong parliamentary system. And I think that's why we tend to score so highly on democratic rating. When you elect your local parliamentarian in the UK, they have a very strong connection to the electorate. So the government is usually selected from people who have been elected directly into parliament. All of my ministers are, with the exception of one who comes from the House of Lords, elected by the local constituencies. Every Friday, they are back in their constituencies holding what they call surgeries, which are the people who voted for them go to see them with all their problems. Which is quite a powerful thing. You vote for somebody to represent you in Parliament. How do you get them to represent you? Well, you go and see them in their office on Friday, and you tell them what's on your mind, what you want them to do for you in Parliament, what problems you want to solve. So that's a very clear way that we put in our system of holding MPs to power. I mean, imagine for your MPs in Parliament of Kutais, if you could get hold of them individually and say to them what you were doing, it's the same thing. Parliament is also very strong at holding high office to account. Every Wednesday in the UK, the Prime Minister has to go to the House of Parliament and answer questions. And he doesn't know what those questions are going to be because it's a very neat trick which has existed for a very long time. Any MP can ask the Prime Minister any question they like. The first question they have to print in either the, on what we call the order paper. The second question can be on anything. So the trick is to say, first question, Prime Minister, please tell me what is in your diary today. The Prime Minister will stand up and say today, I am doing X, Y, and Z. The next question can be anything. Prime Minister, please tell us why you've done X, Y, and Z. And they can be very tough questions. Everybody does this. So he has no idea what the second question is. And this is why you'll see a very strange convention where he'll stand up for the first question and say, I refer the right on the river to the answer I gave before. And then he'll sit down and he'll get hit with something. Most Prime Ministers in their memoirs confess to getting very nervous about Prime Minister's question time. It goes out on television. It can get very bad-tempered. It can get very strong. But it's a way of Parliament holding to account the head of government and saying, what are you doing on that behalf and why? You also have oral questions for other ministers. Um, so for example, the foreign minister, I can't remember what day of the week it is, he goes in, but he will also face similar questions. And you can say to your MP, I'd like you to ask the following question for a minister. And they have to answer. And they can't hide because it's on television that all gets recorded in public record. And they can't go in with a script either and just read an answer if they don't know what's coming. Although they do prepare. The other thing that Parliament does is, is control and exercise oversight of government departments by committees. So we have a number of standing committees the, the most feared committee is the Public Accounts Committee, which holds government departments to account for all the money they spend. And they can summon any minister before them to give evidence and say, right, we'd like you, ex-minister, to come before us and give us a full account of your department's expenditure over the past six months. And they can really grill down into it. And these committees are made, from, made up of all parties. And again, it's a very powerful check on government. 
because government knows that parliament can ask it any question, and they actually have to answer. So, again, on paper, we don't look particularly democratic, but in terms of parliament, particularly the House of Commons, which is directly elected, it is able on behalf of the electorate to really ask the questions that you as an individual voter or member of the public would like answered. Um, in terms of what that means for Georgia, I, mean, I think it's a very different, different situation. It's taken us 800 years to get this far. You've had 20 years. Um, I'll be interested to know your views on what you think of those 20 years. No model is perfect. No model is directly applicable to any other country. The UK is not perfect. Um, but I think it has a lot to offer in terms of the way that, despite the lack of a formal apparatus, and I mean all those things that you would expect to see in a fully functioning democracy in terms of separation of church and state, uh, constitution, clear bill of rights, etc., despite all of that, we have come up with something that works for us. I think what interests me is what Georgia thinks will work for Georgia. And of course, you have a constitutional change next year, which will make quite a significant difference. So I'll stop there. Um, I suppose I give us a sort of not perfect mark out of 10 in terms of the UK. But I'm open to your questions, either on the UK or any other aspect of foreign policy, um, what it's like to be an ambassador in Georgia. Um, I'm in your hands. Thank you. <laughs> around the world, what shape are they? They're circular, 
which is all very nice uh, and very safe. We are opposite each other, which is very confrontational. And if you look in the House of Commons, the government sits on one side and the opposition sits on the other side. And just as a slight diversion, there are two lines drawn down the middle of the room. Just one on each side, a couple of feet in front of the bench. And the reason is supposed to be that these lines are two sword lengths apart. You cannot cross the line. And it was to stop people in history jumping over the line with their sword and killing a member of the opposition. Now, you can't take weapons into the House of Commons anymore, but in the old days, everybody used to have their sword by their side, and this was to protect people. But it's a very confrontational system in that sense. And sometimes those noises are about support. People wave their ballot papers in support. Some of it's about intimidation. If I don't like what you're saying, I might start booing a little bit. But there are limits to what is acceptable and what is not. Parliament is controlled by speaker. And he will, if he thinks the behavior is too out of line, sanction people. And he has various penalties that he can give out. But it's accepted that it's part of the nature of the House of Commons for people to be saying things offline or just generally trying to wind each other up. The standing up and down is people trying to get the attention of the speaker because they want to ask a question. Whenever, whenever anybody speaks, they have to stand. And in order to get the speaker's attention, you've got to be jumping up and down. So we do have this old system that we don't have any electric buttons. In fact, we don't even have enough space for every MP in the House of Commons to sit down. There are 650 MPs, and there is seating for about 500 and something. So if you have a very packed debate chamber, you've got people sitting in all the seats, sitting on each other's laps, standing in the aisles, and you've really got to fight to get the speaker's attention. So that's what's going on there. In terms of the answers and whether they're scripted, the Prime Minister's office will have a good idea of what some of the key subjects are. So, for example, over the last week, it will be the Leveson inquiry, it might be what's going on in Syria, it might be about the new royal baby. So he will come prepared with some lines, but he won't know the exact question. He will have some question from some MP who has a question from the constituent about his blocked drain or about a bus strike in the north of England, which he won't have a clue about and he won't have any briefing about. Some people from his own party might let him know in advance so he can give a really good answer to show the party off well. But in our parliamentary system, there is a sense of pride in being able to answer a question without being scripted. In other words, a really good MP or minister will demonstrate how clever they are by being able to answer it without reading from anything. And people's careers are made if they are viewed as being a particularly good speaker or orator. Which is why you'll find a lot of British people don't read speeches at you. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm particularly good, but I didn't sit here today and say, and then the next thing in my speech is, it's not part of our tradition. So they tend not to cheat in that sense. And some of them are genuinely trying to catch him out and make him look stupid, particularly the opposition. In terms of how the MPs conduct their constituencies and their surgeries, they will usually spend a full day, and some of them spend more if they're not ministers, in their constituency. So if your constituency is, say, Bolton, you will go to Bolton from London, which could be four or five hours away, and you will have a system of appointments with members of the public, and you won't know what it is that anybody within your constituency has the right to come see you in surgery, or indeed the right to come see you in Parliament. And they come with whatever problem. And all MPs have great stories about people who come with some very strange problems that are somewhere in here and not necessarily in the real world. But it can be from anything to somebody who has a very sick child who can't get the treatment, to we have recently, for example, a soldier who had come back from Iraq and accidentally bought a gun back and put in prison, and his family went to their local MP, and their local MP lobbied to try and get justice. So it can be absolutely anything. Or it can be, I just want to talk to you on your policy about X because I don't like it. Now, in terms of the mechanisms, 
the MP's letter in the UK is very powerful. I work for the Foreign Office. If I get a letter from an MP, usually addressed to the Foreign Secretary, we have to answer it. We absolutely have to answer it. So if there is a serious question, we have to answer it and provide a very good reason back to the MP. And if we can't do so, then we have to try and work out why. So it's quite a strong mechanism. Raising it in Parliament and drawing attention to the, to the uh, um, issue can also result, for example, in legislation or in government departments or the press insisting on something thought to be done about it. So MPs are quite powerful in that sense that they can use the parliamentary system, they can use their ability to write letters to ministers that have to be answered and responded to, and they can also <coughs> use the press to achieve something on behalf of their constituents. Uh, and you'll find that different MPs have different causes depending on which part of the country they come from and different things that they promote. Uh, but it, it's quite a good way of ensuring that you know your MP. And of course, the good thing about the system is, if you're an MP, you want to be re-elected. So you want to be very helpful to your constituents. So you can see how that really works in terms of being able to get in the door and solve problems. But of course, you have to be sensible as a constituent. There's no point going and talking about your block to brain, because it's very unlikely. Um, I mean, you might want a letter to, to somebody if you think it's really serious. But if you have a serious problem, it's a good mechanism to be able to solve issues.
but only recently we have had a number of parliamentarians who have been sentenced in a court of law because they had cheated on their expense claims. And we've had a huge scandal in the UK. And as a result, we have tightened up the legislative framework. Uh, and we had one very recently who's just had to resign because he's been investigated for not carrying out his expenses properly. So it's right that what doing in public office is tackled. However, it must be the case that if wrongdoing in office is tackled, due legal process is followed, um, that any arrests are not politically motivated in, in nature, in fact that doesn't really sit well uh, with the essence of legal democracy, and that there is a sense of evidence being, uh, and a case being constructed uh, before somebody is, is brought in, if you like, and arrested. So there is a, a sense that, you know, yes, of course, we must tackle these issues. It's how you tackle them and the way in which that is done. Now, in terms of the criteria, uh, you know, it's not for us to judge, but if there is a sense of political persecution or politically motivated activity, then yes, that is very difficult in terms of <coughs> demonstrating Georgia's suitability on certain criteria under the EU or NATO. And that's why you see some statements recently coming out of the EU and coming out of NATO that say, you know, if you want to go down this route, here's what you ought to do. And that's the reason that we say it. In terms of consequences, um, well, it's very early days, actually. I mean, one of the things that I keep saying to people, your new government has only been in place for a few weeks, not even a couple of months. It's very early days. Clearly, you judge on actions. Um, we will need to do that over a few months. Consequences always sounds very severe, but sometimes the international community just raising an opinion um, can demonstrate that there are consequences. But I think if you look at other examples in other regions, such as Ukraine, you can see that if there is a backsliding concerning public progress, it does have consequences in terms of your trajectory towards greater more romantic integration. Um, uh, you said that Georgia um, uh, wants to join NATO and the uh, uh, European Union. Mm -hmm. But uh, even if we we'll have democracy, we will be able to join NATO with the annexed territories like Tsingwali and Abkhazia. Will it be possible? What do you think? I, I think that requires a solution. Uh, I mean, let's be honest. Um, Georgia, um, we continue to support Georgia's territorial integrity. That includes Abkhazia and South Ossetia. There is a question, if Georgia meets all the criteria for NATO membership, it's not quite there yet. You've just had a Georgia NATO Council, which is praised, conduct of largely free and fair elections, and that's a good tick in the box, but there's still a way to go. But um, getting close to membership without some formula on how one deals with breakaway regions, without compromising Georgia's territorial integrity, um, that's something that needs to be thought about very carefully. Now, I'm of the view as a diplomat, you can find a solution to anything um, it, with careful drafting, careful wording, uh, uh, and careful negotiation. But I think realistically, it's something that's going to be quite difficult um, because what we won't want to do, and what Georgia won't want to do, is to do anything that compromises the territorial integrity of this country and the sovereignty of this country. So I don't have an answer for you, but what I can say is it's something that people will have to start thinking very carefully about as Georgia progresses towards NATO membership.